So welcome everyone to uh, this panel of the SOAS Festival of Ideas, which is on uh, capital and conflict, uh, and the brief discussion of uh, uh, the paper, the panel is as follows. This panel considers how the process of globalization affects the global south, and what are the exclusionary practices of capital that increase the gap between the rich and the poor. He explores the relationship between capital and conflict and looks at the specific examples of states and their participations in the global political economy. What are the global processes that determine international relations and how do politicians and policymakers mediate conflict? To what extent is the crisis of capital in the global north connected uh, to histories of colonialism, war and nationalism? And how can we mediate and decenter the flow of knowledge through a global south perspective? And how does this further contribute to understandings of conflict and capitalism? Now, my name is Alessandra Mezzadri and I work at SOAS in the Development Studies Department. And I am your moderator for the Capital and Conflict panel. And I have with me now four distinguished speakers that will each speak for 10 minutes addressing different uh, issues and angles related to the theme of the panel discussion. Uh, the first is Professor Gilbert Achkar, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who is, was born in Senegal, grew up in Lebanon, researched and taught in Beirut, Paris and Berlin, and is currently Professor of Development Studies and International Relations at SOAS, University uh, of London. Uh, another, pu another published in over 15 languages. Uh, his many books include uh, The Clash of Barbarism, The Making of a New World uh, Disorder, uh, The Arabs and the Holocaust, uh, The Arab-Israeli War on Narratives, Marxism, Orientalism, Cosmopolitanism, The People Want, a Radical Exploration of the Arab uh, Uprising, and most recently, Morbid Symptoms, uh, Relapse uh, in the Arab uh, uh, Spring. Um, Gilbert um, is uh, a, a frequent uh, contributor to Le Monde Diplomatique and uh, a regular columnist in the Arabic uh, uh, press. Uh, he will speak uh, uh, on uh, conflict in capitalism. Then after him, uh, and I'll just kindly ask him to just now uh, uh, come uh, to uh, 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 the webinar, opening his video. Uh, after him, we have uh, uh, Gita. Uh, um, we have, apologies. We have uh, Gita Patel. Apologies. After this, we have Gita Patel, who's a professor at the University of Virginia with three degrees in science and a doctorate from Columbia University, New York in interdisciplinary South Asian uh, uh, studies. She has published widely in both academic and popular venues on the collusive conundrums posed by bringing gender, nation, sexuality, finance, science, media, capital, and aesthetics uh, uh, together. Uh, her first monograph uh, is called Lyrical Movements, Historical Hauntings uh, on Gender, Colonialism and Desire in Mirage's Urdu Poetry. And their second book is uh, Risky Bodies and Techno Intimacy, Reflection on Sexuality, Media, Science, Finance, uh, uses techno intimacies as the locus for interrogating capital science, uh, media, and uh, desire. Uh, Dr. Patel is completing several other projects and uh, is with us uh, uh, today to uh, engage with uh, uh, a series of small books she's engaged in writing on historical pensions, insurance, uh, credit, and debt. And the first is on the first private public pension fund, the Madras Civil Fund, which has started in the late uh, seven, uh, 1700, and whose articulation brought Mughal and European no uh, nation, uh, notions of financial compensation together. This is what we'll present today on, on rethinking pensions and revisioning uh, welfare. After we have uh, uh, third speaker, Terry Cannon, who's a senior research fellow at the IDS and has been working in development studies 
since of 40 years. His current focus is on the social construction of vulnerability and on natural hazards and climate change uh, as challenges uh, to development. He teaches postgraduate courses at the IDS, King's College London and several other European universities and has been affiliated with the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka. Uh, he has published uh, uh, academic and policy work on climate change and disasters and is co-author uh, of At Risk, Nat Natural Hazards, People Vulnerability and Disasters. This is one of the most cited work in vulnerability and disaster studies translated into Spanish and Japanese. Terry's research and capacity building work is mainly in South Asia, especially Bangladesh, including a recent project in Bangladesh to research what can and cannot be done to support livelihoods in cyclone disasters. Other recent publications include the Cultures and Disasters and the International Red Cross World Disaster Report 2014, a focus on <clears throat> pardon me, culture and risk. Uh, he will speak uh, uh, as a, a third speaker on handing fake binaries, uh, decolonizing development, uh, and erasing notions uh, of uh, developed and developing. And the final speaker uh, we have is uh, um, Steve Tsang, who is a professor uh, at SOAS and the director of the SOAS China Institute, uh, and is an emeritus uh, a fellow of uh, St. Anthony's College at Oxford and an associate fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House. He previously served as the head of the School of Contemporary Chinese Studies and as director of the China Policy Institute at the University of Nottingham. Before that, he spent 29 years at Oxford University, where he earned his uh, Dr. Phil and worked as a professor, professorial fellow, dean, and director of the uh, Asian Studies Center at St. Anthony's College. Professor Tsang regularly contributes to public debates on different aspects of issues related to the politics, history, foreign policy, security, and development of the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and East Asia more generally. is known in particular for introducing the concept of uh, consultative uh, Leninism as an analytical framework to understand the structure and nature of politics in contemporary uh, uh, China. Um, now, the uh, uh, focus of his intervention will be on uh, um, uh, uh, talking, uh, uh, in inquiring about the China's narrative about the status of Taiwan uh, uh, based on a research paper that he just completed uh, named From Japanese Colony to Sacred Chinese Territories, uh, where he addresses issues of uh, decolonization of knowledge, also considering the new rising dominant narratives of new great powers like China. So um, I'm extremely pleased to have this uh, uh, tremendous uh, lineup for um, uh, this panel. And uh, um, I will um, uh, uh, now ask the first speaker to uh, turn his uh, video and audio on, Professor Gilbert Achkar, that will uh, uh, talk about conflict in capitalism. Each speaker will uh, uh, speak for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, we will uh, address some initial questions at the end, and then I will take uh, uh, questions uh, from the Q&A box. I will ask kindly all the public that wants to uh, put questions to the panelists to actually uh, uh, write their question in the Q&A box and not on the chat box. You're free to use the chat box, but we will not consider questions put in the chat box, uh, which is generally uh, busier. Thank you very much. The panel will last approximately until 2.45, so I very much hope that you have time to uh, pose your questions to the panelists. Without further ado, I just invite now Gilbert to speak for 10 minutes uh, on the issue of conflict in capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you very much, and uh, glad to, to be here with uh, all uh, the colleagues, all speakers, uh, and the panel. Uh, <clears throat> The, 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 the title is hugely broad. I mean, Capital and Conflict is a very, very, very broad uh, title. And since I'm the first to speak, my, my own intervention will be, has to be uh, very general in order to, to just maybe uh, contribute to setting the, the, the framework of, uh, of the, the discussion. 
um, actually, I mean, the, the, uh, of the two terms of the title, capital and conflict, uh, one is uh, uh, relatively uh, limited in time, that is capital. I mean, the, the real uh, uh, development of capitalism is, is just a matter of a couple of centuries uh, so when you can really speak of, of capitalist economies. Uh, whereas conflict, of course, uh, starts with the with the with the birth of, of the humankind, and, uh, and uh, so that's uh, conflict is much uh, older than than capital. So the question becomes here: if we are mixing the two terms, uh, uh, what uh, kind of uh, conflict is specific to capitalism? And here we get to to the 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 the, the idea of uh, of. Uh, of uh, the, the the specific form of class struggle that is related to, to capitalism, the, 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 the struggle between the, the classical view of the struggle between the, the proletariat, as Marx was the the the, the, the key uh, the key uh, theorist of uh, of the struggle, the specific struggle of of capitalism between the proletariat, that is the working class, or the laborers in general, and and uh, and capital uh, on on the other hand, uh, so if we have if we were to to identify a specific uh, uh, form of conflict that is related to that, that would be uh, this this specific conflict, and indeed with the development of capitalism, this uh, in in the the heartlands of, of capitalism, this uh, this conflict uh, uh, started developing early on, and that's. Here, when uh, you you can uh, see a, a landmark in the identification of the struggle in Marx in his uh, Communist Manifesto, his uh, joint book, book with uh, with Engels, about which which is which starts with class struggle, with the forms of class struggle in history up to the the, the struggle between workers and and capitalists being the the this new form of of struggle in in. In, uh, in the new age of, uh, of, uh, of, of capital. Uh, but at the same time, it's obvious that uh, uh, capitalism developed in those core countries and the heartlands of capitalism through uh, a relation to the rest of the world. And uh, then we, we got into this new configuration of the world with, uh, which, <clears throat> which took the form of what uh, came to be called the, the, the division between global north and, and global south, with those uh, uh, core capitalist countries in, in, in the global north uh, subjugating the, 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 the global south economically, uh, first through uh, uh, plunder uh, and then through a structural dependence, uh, through uh, 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 economic uh, domination with the uh, generalization of the of capitalism as uh, a mode of uh, of production so that happens gradually but with this uh, generalization we have a, a structure which is hierarchical structure of uh, of uh, of the global economy that was put in place uh, uh, with a structural dependence of the global south uh, towards the, the 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 global north and even uh, uh, for a long while, the what was called by, by Gunder Frank the development of underdevelopment, that is a de-development actually of, uh, of the global south, that, that, that is in one phase of, uh, of, this, uh, of, um, of this historical uh, uh, development. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I worked recently on, uh, on a study of uh, of uh, socialism and uh, and colonialism, and I was struck by by the fact that the the uh, conscience of the colonial issue among, within the socialist movement uh, came so late. I mean, it's only in the early 20th century that you start having discussions about uh, uh, about colonialism actually within the socialist movement which was very, uh, very much uh, european or let's say global north in, in those core countries of uh, of uh, of capitalism so th this discussion uh, comes uh, very very late uh, and of course it will be boosted uh, later on by the revolutionary changes that happened with the first world war uh, the 
Russian Revolution, the Russian Revolution trying to appeal to the, the global South. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, this will, of course, lead to, to the, 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 the massive changes that happened after the uh, the, the the Second World War uh, and uh, the the age of decolonization and there uh, of course you, you have a rise a political rise of, of the the global south and uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the the I mean uh, the this uh, the, the fight the struggle the, the issue of imperialism becomes a, a, a very central issue. In, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in global struggles. Um, and uh, now uh, with the, the age of what has been called globalization, we have a, a number of, of uh, key changes towards uh, in relation with all that. I mean, of course you have a permanence of, uh, of uh, some of the factors that uh, I mentioned. You have a permanence of, uh, of the uh, uh, North-South uh, uh, exploitation uh, subjugation, economic subjugation, and political subjugation. This this carries on. We can see it uh, uh, carrying on even with uh, with uh, the pandemic. And just to speak of something very topical, but uh, the, the 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 impact, the social economic impact of the pandemic, let alone uh, the, the health issues, but the social economic impact of the pandemic is is. Uh, uh, much uh, harder and harsher on the global south than uh, it is uh, on, on the global north. So the, these issues carry on. However, we have a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, major uh, changes that occurred over the, 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 the decades of, uh, of what has been called globalization. Um, and uh, uh, one of them is, is the rise of China. Uh, as an economic uh, powerhouse. And uh, I think the, the, the implications of this are, are just, uh, I mean, beginning to unfold. It's, it's uh, quite early to, 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 uh, to really assess this, but uh, it, it is uh, the first real breach in the, in the North-South div divide that has characterized uh, the global uh, economy, uh, the global political economy over over uh, two centuries, and uh, this the rise of China as uh, as a new uh, global power uh, is uh, is of uh, of utmost importance and uh, uh, will weigh necessarily and weighs already necessarily on on the configuration or, or the perception of uh, of the world and of global conflicts. The 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 second one. So you have. Uh, uh, one part of the South uh, join, I mean, competing now with the North uh, in, in terms of global power. And you have another development, which is the emergence of the South within the North. And that's the product of migration and this massive uh, uh, migration of, uh, of the, the, the last uh, decades uh, is, uh, has created this very, very strongly. So you have, I mean, the, the north-south divide, if you want, is, is one that is now also within the global north. It is represented within the global north uh, has, uh, through, uh, through this issue of, uh, of, of, uh, of migration. Uh, so I think the, these events, uh, these developments, of course, they are uh, I mean, open to, to a, a lot of uh, of, uh, of, the, of reflection because they are uh, really sea changes in, the, in, the, in global history actually, but uh, they, they, they have uh, uh, implications also on the, on the, the, the struggles. Uh, as I see it, they are uh, actually uh, uh, facilitating a, a real globalization of struggles. I mean, we are moving from the age of internationalism to the age of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, actually much more global uh, type of struggle, uh, which uh, uh, we can see even in the, in the uh, increasing globalization of, uh, of, uh, of forms of, uh, of revolt uh, on, on, on the classical class issue, on, on, on the political economy issues. And we can see this uh, global trend of uh, of uh, 
uprisings of revolts. And that last year was, I mean, the year 2019 was, was very striking in this regard with, uh, with all these uh, from Hong Kong to Chile to, uh, to, 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 uh, to Sudan, to Algeria, to all these revolts against, uh, 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 in some way, all of them related to, to the effects of, uh, of neoliberalism as uh, the, the, uh, the dominant paradigm. Um, we, we can see that also in the, in the, through, through the cultural, the technological dimension of globalization, the, the communication dimension of globalization, uh, helping uh, and combining with what I said about the global south and the global north in, in globalizing struggles. We can see that in very much in uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, wave of, uh, of struggle. Uh, most, uh, most, uh, most recently. So we are really getting into what uh, uh, Boaventura de, de Sousa Santos called insurgent cosmopolitanism. I, I like the, the, the formula of, of insurgent cosmopolitanism because I think this is very much uh, the, 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 now the form of, of social conflict that is uh, uh, that has been developing and will carry on developing uh, with, uh, with the advent of globalization. Thank you very much, Gilbert. That was such an insightful way to actually get into the uh, first intervention of our panel. And I already see a lot of uh, very productive lines of inquiry for me to actually uh, uh, probe you at the end in relation to this tension between uh, the spatial and social relation of conflict, as well as in the direction of struggle. Without further ado, I just now ask Gita Patel to um, uh, give us her uh, 10 minutes. And Gita will uh, speak to the theme of uh, uh, pension and welfare, uh, decentering historical work from uh, a, a, a focus on uh, classical historical takes that of welfare coming from uh, the West and France in particular to decenter instead the analysis towards uh, India. Thank you, Gita. You have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. I'm really happy to be on this panel with all these uh, amazing thinkers. Um, let me start right away. Um, and I, you know, there's stuff that I've left out, obviously, because it's a fairly complicated argument. But so pensions are currently under intense scrutiny. As the ratio of debt to GDP rises in country after country, employees and employers, citizens and governments lock in contest over a type of compensation they once availed without question. My research opens a different sightline into what might have been many have taken for granted as the, gen, uh, the uh, genesis of pensions by decentering the pension story, which is usually said to start in Europe. Colonial, colonial India, I suggest that colonial India is one precursor to the sorts of pensions with which we are now quite familiar. It also begins to re re reveal the way in which fiscal governance, even in Europe, becomes part of a, juris a jurisdictional imperative um, through both uh, of colonial states. Um, the historian Philip Stern argues that the East India Company, and I am talking about the 18th and uh, late 18th, early 19th century, when the discussion on pensions had become sort of uh, really spread in different parts of the world. Um, the historian Philip Stern argues that the East India Company was not just a corporation, which then became a political entity, uh, but began, uh, you know, and it's sort of the standard story is it became political entity when it became, when it began to consolidate itself in India through charters and the acquisition of military and naval resources. But um, Stern argues that the political, that the East India Company was always a political corporation, in other words, a corporate state. So it actually uh, takes back the idea of the corporate state from the present to the colonial period. Stern then gives us a sightline on governance and governmentality. To Stern's arguments, I actually add another argument that the East India Company established itself not just as a corporate state or as a company state, 
but specifically as a fiscal state through financial jurisdictions. And we think of financialization as, again, contemporary, and I'm taking it back um, to the 18th and 19th century. And many of these jurisdictions were in fact compensatory in character, the things that, that we think of as um, part of the welfare state, pensions, annuities, and consistent salaries. Um, in passing the financial history of the East India Company, it's possible to see the inceptions of statecraft through fiscal manipulation as well as fiscal municipals, whose mobilizations give it a jurisdictional shape as a corporate state. And I call this kind of um, financial collective that states got involved with setting up life finance and continues into the contemporary. For me, this continues into the contemporary period. We can talk about it later. So pensions in India, I want to go back to the 1700s when a significant contingent of British colonial employees in South India, uh, many of whom were reduced to bankruptcy and vagrancy at the end of their service, sent a petition to the East India Company in which they threatened to steal from the East India Company if they were not permitted to start a pension fund. Now, most people think of um, East India Company employees as especially the European ones making a ton of money and coming back. In fact, I would say that was true for maybe 5%. I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, but very few employees actually made a ton of money and came back. The bulk of them ended up vagrants, um, debtors in prison, um, dying with almost no money. Um, after protracted uh, negotiations, the company said yes. This British colonial uh, setting for the establishment of pensions and social security schemes is rarely recognized as a source for their modern counterparts. This fund called the Madras Civil Fund actually began in the 1780s. And it's important because rather than being handed out to the East India Company, this fund was argued for by employees composed from their own contributions. And this is when uh, a time of the poor, when people talk about the, you know, there's a lot of history on the poor laws, um, certainly in the, in the UK. This, this fund was uh, composed from their own contributions at a time when people who are usually bereft of resources rarely fashioned their own means of support. And the shape and form this, um, the employees' arguments took actually, as well as the genre that the arguments uh, obeyed, they owe their allegiances not to European ways of uh, forms of argument, arguing, but in fact petitions written by local uh, South Indian weavers and Dalit Paraya agriculturalists in South India. And we can talk about this um, at a later point if it, if it comes up. The East India Company threatened by its employees in the late 18th century was a company state severely strapped for funds. No financier was willing to loan it money um, locally, nor was the public purchasing its bonds. Unlike the first European pensions in which public or royal monies were segregated from private capital, money in the semi-privatized semi corporate pension fund, um, perhaps the first defined contribution pension scheme created by East India British uh, employees were not, was not so easily ring-fenced. The Madras Civil Fund invested in loans as well as the bonds of the company state, even as the money from salaries used to fund the pensions became the reserve that permitted the company to roll over some of its local loans and justify company rule in the face of charges. That, um, that it had defrauded Indians. Now, though exchanges and the viability and necessity for universal pensions were also occurring in Europe and Americas between people like Thomas Paine and Marquis de Condorcet, um, and as well as their nemesis, Thomas Malthus, these discussions were actually occurred more than 10 years after the pension fund in Madras was already established. And some valuable distinctions between the civil fund and th those put together by uh, your American economic and political philosophers was something that the East India Company employees understood immediately and that went unrecognized um, by Payne and Malthus. First, pensions were part and parcel of an employee's wage relation. Um, and this is something Marx talk, talks about, you know, almost, um, I mean, I'd say 100, almost 100 years later. Um, and, and second, that pensions form the nucleus of an investment in the company or corporate state, an investment that enabled the company or the state to live beyond its means. In other words, employees or denizens invested their funds in the ongoing life of a country or a state. 
Um, and actually, and this investment was made through their pension funds. It was, it be, it, we can think of it as an effective promissory note that employees and state functionaries and denizens, in other words, people who live in the area, invested in, which relied on trust as well as the future life and survival of the person, state of corporation on whom the note was drawn. So in other words, um, because you have a pension fund, you actually insure the life because you have a pension fund, you actually insure the life of the organization that's giving you the fund. I mean, so it really undoes uh, the standard idea of how these funds are constituted. Um, given that pensions found their genesis, not in the so-called metropole, but in the global South, in the colonies, um, the shape these early pensions adopted owed as much to pre-existing uh, Indian uh, practices of compensation as they did to schemes drafted in London or Paris. And one of them is Mughal land grants to soldiers uh, accompanied uh, with pensions, which became part of a kind of understanding of how pensions were constituted. This argument um, is actually grounded in, uh, uh, in the colonies where pensions, and they challenge the conclusions of scholars. It's written a long time ago, and it's a lovely book by Robin Blackburn in 2003. Uh, who locates the genesis of pension funds firmly in Europe in the late 19th century. So the, the late 18th and early 19th century in South Asia also saw the beginnings of what would be termed the benevolent state, which mon with money set aside by the British Parliament for their depredations incurred by the company. By the late 1820s, the company state uh, began to restyle itself as the benevolent state, which incorporated into its purview benevolent um, uh, health, prisons, infrastructure, orphan schools, and pensions to its denizens. And the Madras Civil Fund was its first incursion into this type of statecraft, one that would later become to, uh, come to be called welfare. And here we see a few more parables about how finance works fall short of the usual conventions. Welfare is as much provision of states as it is of self-funded claims or demands made by those who belong. So in other words, those who belong, we think of welfare as coming from the state. And what I'm arguing is actually welfare comes not from the states, but the idea of welfare itself is constituted and crafted by those who belong. So in however tenuous and tentative a key, uh, certain genres of welfare, uh, when they've been established, what they reveal is the imprimatur of the corporation as a state an imprimatur that was granted to the company or corporate state through fiscal jurisdictions long before nations or corporations took those jurisdictions as their own. And these jurisdictions had, had, had at their heart um, the ensuring of a life of both the state corporations as well as those who belong to them. That is welfare was insurance for the state as much as it is for the pensioner. And when you look at the 19th century arguments um, after the, uh, the colonial, the, actually the British state the, uh, took over late the sort of mid 19th century, this kind of colonial reasoning continues um, in the sidebars of the arguments. At stake is the fiscal, fiscal accountability and moral responsibility of both the state, corporate state, and both sorts of parties. Now we often separate the state from the corporation. We think the welfare state and the corporation are separate. So another thing I'm asking us to do if we go back to the colonial period is to actually reconsider all these separations as um, something that is coming in the present that's part of an, uh, a neoliberal kind of genesis um, of the idea of the state and the corporation coming together. Um, so at stake is the fiscal accountability and moral responsibility of both sorts of parties, both the, the corporate state and um, the pension, uh, the pensioner. And at stake uh, is trust as a solvent that enables liquidity for only one set of parties in the compact. Um, and we can talk about this later. So in other words, it works, uh, the, the only uh, party that remains, is permitted to remain liquid is the corporate state. And here, uh, you know, I wanna just close with a few points, the welfare, which I've sort of articulated, I think over and over again, that welfare, the genesis of welfare might not have been where we commonly put it in, uh, in democratic polities, but in colonial ones. Um, and pensionary 
uh, promises made and disavowed assumed other valences under the company's um, East India Company's rhetoric of welfare for its subjects. This was a raison d'etre subverted by the company's systematic policy of extraction at the same time as which it offered something it called benevolence. This constitutive contradiction between care and ruin, I think, holds lessons for contemporary struggles over pensions around the world as more and more people grapple with tensions between what their pensions mean to them and what they mean to the organizations that fund or oversee them. I have no idea how long I took, but um, I figured I would try and end early. So I cut a bunch of stuff and I hope that made sense as a result. It did make sense at all and it was actually spot on time. So thanks uh, uh, Gita for this. I just found your uh, conceptualization of the East India Company as a corporate state really uh, challenging and entirely uh, convincing. And I think about my own work, uh, when we have to focus a lot about the rise of global corporations during the neoliberal era, which is uh, generally set by the 1970s, uh, while indeed the first global corporation was the East India Company. If you look at the flows of commodities and finance that we see during the uh, pre-colonial and colonial period. So I find your talk entirely fascinating. It does flow naturally from Gilbert's uh, more general setting. And I think as we decenter debates now towards uh, the global south, um, it will, uh, let's get now into also the issue of uh, uh, knowledge uh, production. Now we have uh, uh, the, our next speaker, who is uh, Terry uh, Cannon, and uh, he will uh, um, address uh, issues of uh, 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 ending fake binaries and decolonizing development also in terms of decolonizing and decentering the terms that we come to use uh, on a daily basis that already produce uh, a knowledge ba based hierarchies uh, across the world economy. Thanks, Terry. Now it's uh, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very nice to be here with you. I'm going to talk a bit about capital, but in, in some ways to say that analysis of capital is not enough. And when I refer to conflict, it's going to be about conflicts of ideas, including the fake binary between developed and developing. So I'm, I'm tying into this, but it's much coming much wider from the arguments about decolonizing aid and decolonizing development studies. So I, I've chosen this title to show my concerns about how development aid and development studies is changing for the worse under current systems of power. I'm gonna start with a very simplistic statement. The world is the way it is because those who have power want it to be this way. The world is the way it is because those who have power want it to be this way. And I think what has happened with development studies is that this is, is being forgotten. Um, ways of compromising with um, getting funding and so on is, it, is enabling compromises which make development studies um, weakened. Uh, and that's part of my argument. Um, and of course, I've used the phrase those who have power, and that is a, a shorthand for a very complex set of interlocking and conflicting interests. And I don't think they can be neatly incorporated into the title of this session around capital. Um, I think radical critiques of development have sometimes given away too much in terms of talking about capitalism and globalization, as if all problems of exploitation and oppression of peoples in the world can be tied to capitalism. So I think that narratives about the 10% or the 1% fall into the trap of seeing the world in terms of a kind of a pyramid scheme of one dominant power system, um, capitalism. And I think this gives an easy ride to those classes who dominate in quasi-feudal or semi-feudal systems that co coexist in hybrid forms of, um, uh, with capitalism in much of Asia and Latin America. And I think it, related to this as well, if we are understanding and wanting to end gender oppression, it's extremely difficult to imagine that gender oppression is related to capitalist domination because in many parts of the world, it is related to these non-capitalist or pre-capitalist systems, something perhaps we can come back to in the discussion. Um, so those who have power 
wherever have the ability to command systems that allocate resources, assets such as land and water, jobs, livelihood and income. These allocations are not natural or God-given, they are socially constructed. So the way that the powerful command these assets and income are designed to produce the benefits for the minority and the arrangements for this are not an accident. The economically powerful also dominate political systems that legalize and legitimize these allocations. And they also enable to, they're able to determine the rates of taxation, which are usually low for corporations and rich people. So these taxes could not be used for creating greater equity. So these systems of power themselves are the reason there is much suffering that development aid and research claims to be fixing. So the way resources and incomes are allocated is the reason aid is supposedly needed to help fix these problems which are caused by power. Now, I don't think that framing power is so helpful because, um, uh, sorry, hundreds of millions of people in, are oppressed in semi-feudal or quasi-feudal systems of land tenure and other forms of local power, which is why I don't think it's, it's particularly helpful to have this kind of monopoly notion of capital being all powerful. P power also involves conflicts of gender, ethnicity, caste, sexuality, age, and disability. And the key question here is why would those who benefit from these systems of power be willing to give them up? Does development aid actually challenge those who have power? Um, if not, then how can we expect development aid to be solving problems if it is not addressing the root causes of what is um, causing the problems we're supposedly addressing. And a question for us, would aid and research on development be different if we were not dependent on those who have power for funding? What would it take to really decolonize aid and development studies? Now, I fully realize that what I'm saying oversimplifies, but does it simplify away from the truth or in the direction of greater honesty? I think that many aid interventions have a very low potential for changing the ways that the powerful decide what happens in the world. Uh, do we think that development interventions can somehow be neutral and not disturb the powerful? If what is done in the name of, of development is neutral to power, then can it really do much good? And are we confident and are the funders confident that after 10 years, there will still be some evidence that what happened with the aid or whatever the project was, is still visible and having an impact. And I'd like to come back to that point in the discussion afterwards. Now, there's a lot of talk at the moment in the COVID crisis about building back better, but I think it has to be different. I don't think it's possible to build back better under existing systems of power. I would argue that it's only possible to build back better if it is also different. Where the systems of power are changed so that resources and incomes are distributed more fairly and oppression is reduced. That of course is not easy. Going against power is difficult and can be very risky. What I'm really calling for is greater honesty. So that if the aid and the research cannot be effective without changing power, then we must say so. If a problem such as hunger cannot be solved without changing the systems of power which cause hunger, then we must say so. And how does development studies help? Development aid claims to influence the way that power is used to push back against some of the negative impacts. Development studies supposedly provides the research that both identifies who needs help and how it should happen. Now, I believe that development research is increasingly avoiding analyzing the causes of exploitation and oppression. Otherwise, the funding may not be available. So we modify what we do in order that we get the funding. We are embedded within the systems of power that use aid for power. And development organizations do what they can rather than what is needed by poor and oppressed people. And I think this is really something I want to emphasize is organizations that are involved in so-called aid and the research or institutions are doing what they need to do to stay as an organization and to carry on getting their income and that is not always the same as what is needed by poor and oppressed people, especially if what the organization does is to ignore or, or sub subordinate what is actually causing the problems of the people. 
So how different would our ideas and analysis and our behavior be if we were not having to do it within and for our organization? Um, development research organizations are trying even to increase their funding from billionaire philanthropists, sorry, tax evaders, people from the 1% who are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Can we always claim that we are investigating the real causes of the problems we're helping, trying, supposedly trying to help to fix? Do the standards that are used for interventions effective and actually working? So we have all these buzzwords like participation, being grassrooted, community-based or community-led, um, ensuring local ownership, being pro-poor, leaving no one behind, pro um, empowering people. All of these words have been critiqued for decades, some of them for decades. And these are just being forgotten. These criticisms are being forgotten. What is, does anyone actually go back to find out if people were really empowered, whether it was community led and so on? I think we get sucked into using dev speak and jargon that fails to do with root causes and instead enables the reason for problems to be covered up. We are full of jargon words that rip meaning out of analytical research. Food security, governance, resilience, sustainable, transformation. Um, do we ever seriously dis discuss how long transformational change may take? It took 100 years in Britain for women to get the vote. How long would it take to end feudal land tenure systems in uh, much of Asia? I think food security is a good example of terminology that takes the explanation out of the problem. So 30 years ago, we would have talked about hunger. Today, people talk about food security. Before, we said people are hungry. Now I expect almost everyone listening in, into this is aware that there is enough food in the world to feed everyone in this world and some left over. So what happened is that instead of discussing the political and economic reasons why people are hungry, what has happened is it's been tr transformed into a situ situation where it is discussed in terms of more food needs to be produced. There needs to be food security. So once it trans transfers into this language, it's ripped away from actually looking at the causes of why people have hunger. So development is embedded within existing systems of power and trying to push against them is contaminated and distorted um, so that we can feel comfortable within them. And I think they pay us, so we fail to adequately chain, challenge them. And we have the extraordinary situation where institutions like my own are celebrating the 50th or 60th anniversaries. Why are we celebrating instead of looking at why are we still necessary or considering believing that we're necessary? I think it's where we are integrated into this bogus binary of developed, developing, um, global North, global South. And I think that this problem is a bogus binary which disguises why people are um, suffering and pretending that there's um, something special, exceptional about these two sets of countries. And this, I believe, overrides the issue of exploitation and oppression, which takes place in all countries. So hunger in Britain may have very different types of explanation than those of hunger in say India or Tanzania. But to um, assess them, there are two types of countries used. And I don't think this is useful. The causes in India of hunger will not be the same as in Tanzania, and they will be different in one part of India than in another part of India. But the value of having a developed developing binary is only useful to perpetuate a system that is convenient and valuable for the more powerful countries to insist that this binary is useful to separate an analysis of hunger and poverty in Britain or the United States from the analysis of hunger and poverty in the so-called global south. And I think that aid and development research become the means to perpetuate the idea that there are two sets of countries, that they are meaningful in this binary. I think it becomes uh, a way in which it can be assumed that one set of countries has the answers and the funding, which then must be transferred from us to them. And I think the fundamental problem here is this disguises what are the causes of the problems and how those causes relate to systems of power um, within which aid and development studies are themselves embedded. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Terry. You were um, part on time as well, so that helped me a lot. And of course, I very much liked the um, ending notes of your interventions in relation to the need to address the political economy factors that actually uh, determine uh, socioeconomic outcomes across different regions, because they can be very, very different indeed. I just wonder, uh, in a context where, at least in the UK, we're witnessing um, you know, these arguments perhaps being weaponized to reduce aid, how this will plan, uh, plan out. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the FID uh, merger with the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, for instance, you, you know, that in a sense, uh, uh, we can argue would agree on the need to ditch the developed developing uh, countries uh, uh, dividing line, but perhaps for a set of all different reasons. Um, I will actually uh, continue and uh, get to the uh, uh, um, last, uh, but not least, contribution of our panel uh, that uh, will take uh, debates on decolonizing uh, knowledge further and uh, uh, um, address also how we need to do this exercise keeping in mind uh, the rise of new powers and their own narratives uh, around uh, new forms perhaps of colonization of knowledge and, and then and hence uh, our need to call out those as well. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I ask our um, um, last speaker, Professor Steve Sang to uh, start his intervention. Thank you very much, Steve, you have 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Alexandra. Great pleasure to um, speak with this distinguished group of colleagues. And of course, nobody in this group needs me to remind us that colonization is about power. And therefore, decolonization of ideas, decolonization of knowledge is really about countering the dominance of ideas being imposed by certain powers. Usually when we look at something like this, we see it in the old colonial context, the global north and the south, the uh, old colonial powers, they were rich capitalists and dominant shaping history previously and shaping narrative previously. And I'm very glad that Gilbert in his opening remarks reminded us that when we do so, we have to bear in mind that there are rising powers. And some of those rising powers have an equally strong capacity to shape and impose narrative. And China is a very good example of that. Um, Gilbert also reminded us of the case of Hong Kong, which I thought was particularly interesting, even though I'm not going to say very much more about Hong Kong. It's interesting in the way how Gilbert mentioned it, because he is raising an example, a territory, a people that was previously part of the British Empire. And now it is, well, at least last year, it tried it to in, in, in a way, rebel against Mother China, which is what China would like it to be described. But from Hong Kong's perspective, it would look like a new colonial master. And that is an interesting uh, idea that we need to bear in mind. And the main issue in Hong Kong is about the idea of whether they could or could not decide their uh, political system and their way of life and even their own future. What I wanted to focus on for the rest of my uh, 10 minutes, on the idea of the, the colonization of knowledge using the case of China, I will pick in particular the case of Taiwan. The reason why I picked Taiwan is that the Chinese government has for a very long time now, remind the rest of the world that Taiwan is part of China. Taiwan is, in their words, a sacred territory of China from the ancient time. That there is such a thing as a one China principle that the Chinese government asks all other countries to 
respect and not hold. Some do. Some other countries, like particularly all the other Greek powers, who say that they have a one China policy, which is somewhat different from China's own one China principle. But fundamentally, the one China principle is the idea that Taiwan is part of China. This is uh, historical, this is not contestable, and everybody must accept and embrace that. By and large, the world does so. But what really is the history of China's relationship with Taiwan? If we look at that objectively as academics, as intellectuals, we will have a bit of a problem accepting the Chinese government's narrative of Taiwan being uh, historically incontestably part of China, or that is a sacred territory of China. The concept of sacred territory, a sacred territory of a country, is a very strange one to begin with. If, if, if a country describes a particular territory as a sacred, does it imply the rest of the country, which is not being so described, is any less sacred part of that same country? Some things to bear in mind and think about. Now, looking at the history of it, what's interesting is that um, Taiwan has not been for one single second been part of the People's Republic of China or was under the jurisdiction of it ever. Not for one single second. Okay, let's see if we expand the definition of China from beyond the People's Republic of China to just sort of China, China. When did Taiwan become uh, jurisdictionally part of the government in control of China? Now that happened in the late 17th century uh, under the Qing, which is the last imperial dynasty in China. And the Chinese government would tell you Qing is Chinese. There is a slight problem there because the Qing government was not actually Chinese. It was Manchu. They conquered China and they conquered other parts of Asia and ran them as a great empire. China was a colony of the Manchus. And when Taiwan was taken by the Manchus, it was also a colony of the Manchus. So you get into a bit of an issue that if you look at uh, different colonies of the old, say, British Empire, and one of those colonies now say that, oh, well, because we were all previously part of the British Empire, therefore territory X, another previous colony of the UK is basically my sacred territory. You've got a bit of a problem there in, in logical terms. And in any event, Taiwan was ceded by the Manchu Empire to the Japanese after a war which they fought over Korea in 1894 to 95. And when Taiwan was ceded, there was really not much of any objections from China. It was a far away frontier region, uh, largely populated, not by Han Chinese. So really they weren't that bothered about it. And they basically, allowed Taiwan to be a Japanese colony where it did in some ways flourish um, for nearly 50 years. And the status was only changed, or the idea of Taiwan status was only to be changed in the wartime conference of Cairo in 1943, when the leader of China at the time, Chiang Kai-shek, asked for Taiwan to be returned to China. And the allied powers, Churchill representing UK and Roosevelt representing the United States thought that, okay, you want some former Japanese territory or some Japanese territory, we don't care, you can have it. But you will not get the other things you want, which is uh, resources to fight the war. And that was the first time that ta Taiwan was to be given to China. In 1945, at the end of the war, by order of the Supreme Commander of Allied Powers, Douglas MacArthur, an American general, a Chinese army as part of the Allied Occupation Force was dispatched to Taiwan to take occupation. And under international law, the status of Taiwan is not changed 
until a peace, peace, peace treaty is signed. And the peace conference was the San Francisco Conference of 1951. And because by then, China had become divided, the Communist Party had won the Civil War and seized power of mainland China in 1949. And the UK recognized that, the US didn't. And the US continued to recognize the remnant of Chiang Kai-shek's government, which had retreated to Taiwan as an island without. Taiwan's status became undecided because the Japanese renounced sovereignty over Taiwan, but did not hand it over to either Chinese government or anybody else. So under international law, Taiwan became an undecided uh, territory. And then we have the Korean War in 1950. And when the Korean War happened, the American government under Truman decided to contain the Korean War and avoid the risk of China getting involved and spreading the Korean War to become a third world war. And therefore he had a policy of neutralizing the Taiwan Strait. And at that point, Chiang Kai, uh, Mao Zedong in control of China thought that it means the Americans were involving themselves in the Chinese Civil War, preventing the Chinese government and the Communist Party to take over Taiwan or liberate Taiwan. And then it was after that point that suddenly Taiwan was elevated to a sacred status. And Mao tried and created two crises in the 1950s, and then he realized that the Americans would not actually use Taiwan as a base to attack mainland China, so he got relaxed. Taiwan's status was put on the back burner. Then in the post-Mao post period, in the beginning of the 1980s under, under Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese government started to rethink about Taiwan. They still wanted to, to get Taiwan, uh, but they were not prepared to use force. But Taiwan, for the first time, began to acquire a kind of geostrategic significance because of a change in the defense doctrines in China. All through the Maoist period until the late 1970s, Mao had a policy of people's war, which was that China would not defend its coastal region. And if there were to be an invasion of China, let the enemy go into the inland of China. Chinese forces would close the coast and then destroy the uh, landlocked enemy. With the reform and opening policy of Deng Xiaoping and the massive development of urban coastal China, China decided that it needs a forward maritime defense policy, what they call the first island chain. And the first island chain goes from the southern tip of Japan through the islands of Taiwan, further south into the South China Sea, uh, towards the coast of your Philippines and the uh, Malay Peninsula. There you have it. Taiwan is now strategically critical to the forward maritime defense perimeter of China. But still, the Chinese government did not have much of a navy in those days. And by now, under Xi Jinping, China has built up a navy which is numerically larger than that of the United States Navy. Now they can nearly have the capability to take Taiwan or hold Taiwan, and Taiwan becomes so important to them. What really I think matters here is that the Chinese changed their view about Taiwan because of the changing strategic considerations of them, but they force us to simply accept their interpretation of that history. And that I think is a bit of a problem. You can talk about Taiwan in those terms. You can talk about Xinjiang in similar terms. You can talk about Tibet in similar terms. And people in Hong Kong will say, you can talk about Hong Kong in those terms. I think we have to bear in mind that when we are talking about great new rising powers, when they try to impose their narrative on their people, they sometimes, in the case of China, also try to change our narrative. This is where I think if we are looking at the decolonization of knowledge and of ideas, we do have to contest, contest it. Words have meanings and words matters more than just the meanings. 
it can actually affect real politics and real people's life. I think I have taken up more than my 10 minutes, so I will stop here and hand it back to uh, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Steve. You didn't. Now, everybody's uh, spot on time, according to academic timings as well, which we shall also uh, consider. So what I'll do now, I'll just uh, throw um, a few questions uh, at the panel, mostly one each and then a general one uh, that I'm just is particularly pressing for me that I think perhaps so speakers can uh, uh, address. And then uh, I will uh, 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 ask the speakers uh, to quickly respond. And as they do so, I will start collating uh, uh, questions uh, uh, from the public, and I, I would invite the public to actually pose their questions uh, in the Q&A uh, sections, because I will just uh, uh, speak from there. Um, I will start uh, in the order of presentation. Um, and to Gilbert, um, I would just, uh, from your uh, uh, talk, what uh, uh, fascinated me was uh, the issue of uh, how addressing the very broad concerns of conflict in capitalism might be done through uh, different uh, uh, methodologies, in a sense. And fr from what uh, you uh, presented, it seems to me that there is uh, at least a two four ways uh, to uh, address, uh, to, to explore conflict in capitalism. And this, the first is more spatial in nature in relation to a distinction between the global north and global south uh, develop, developing. We oppose this uh, uh, distinction in different ways uh, during this panel. But a second one is around social relations. Uh, uh, the capital labor relations being central, a conflictual, uh, uh, in its conflictual character being central in capitalism. And I would like to know if uh, you could explore how the two uh, might enforce each other, but sometimes also sort of uh, 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 undermine each other or, or combine in very complex uh, 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 ways uh, uh, indeed. Because as you rightly said, not only we see the rise of the South, uh, in the north with the uh, rising uh, uh, migration, but uh, we have always had uh, um, the uh, um, south characterized by um, uh, highly polarized uh, levels of income, inequality, where um, global elites have always been very much part and parcel of uh, the global north uh, uh, um, since colonial time, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I wonder if you can uh, sort of uh, uh, um, elaborate on these uh, uh, two four ways in which we can see uh, 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 conflictual um, uh, relations under capitalism. And uh, to Gita, uh, uh, you uh, mentioned a number of uh, uh, issues that I find mostly fascinating, and uh, uh, particularly the idea of welfare, not as a state provision, but as uh, uh, a provision to those that belong. Now, I'd like to you to sort of, uh, if possible, to expand on, on this concept and uh, particularly in relation to what we can learn from this in relation to struggles over welfare uh, today. And also, uh, if we do frame welfare in these terms, uh, who is in and who uh, is out? Um, the uh, uh, question I have uh, for Terry uh, pertains uh, to um, uh, the basis for decolonizing uh, uh, knowledge and world, well, decolonizing uh, structures of power aid in this uh, uh, context. And I wonder if you could um, expand on the challenging of decolonizing aid in the context of declining aid rates and uh, the entry of uh, massive entry, as a matter of fact, and well before the disappearance of uh, key donors, um, the massive entries of private actors in, uh, in uh, 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 the aid sector, and also the rise of new uh, non-Western donors like China, in fact, which uh, 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 now much evidence suggested might have uh, uh, again, very sort of colonizing, neo-colonizing uh, 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 
projects and objectives uh, with reference to uh, um, regions uh, like uh, uh, the Horn of Africa, for instance, uh, you know, in, in the job I, uh, um, in, in the type of work I do. Now, the entry, for instance, of uh, Chinese capital as an alternative to aid uh, in certain parts of Africa seems to be posing a, a whole set of new challenges. Uh, and, and finally, to, uh, to, to um, Steve, um, uh, well, you know, you meant you you uh, put a, a case that of Taiwan uh, in relation to uh, uh, um, a, a sort of the imposition of Chinese narratives, and and I do wonder, for instance, uh, what is uh, the uh, Taiwanese basis on which. Uh, these narratives uh, uh, themselves, however, can be strengthened because Taiwan is also the site of uh, um, massive uh, capital conglomerates uh, like Foxconn, for instance. So uh, uh, when we think about imposition from China to um, uh, these uh, uh, territories, uh, the imposition is to whom and which instead might be uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the um, uh, uh, segments or like the, the the classes that entirely embrace locally uh, this type of discourse. And finally, I will ask uh, all um, all um, panelists to please uh, 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 consider uh, commenting uh, on the uh, how the 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 impact of COVID nineteen uh, speak about. Uh, conflicts in capitalism, uh, because as a matter of fact, I don't think that what we have seen with the pandemic is uh, uh, um, so much the uh, impact on uh, spatial divides uh, so neatly, north-south uh, or, or developing developed as one would have expected. But as a matter of fact, if we look at uh, what Akil and Bembe has called the necropolitics uh, of capitalism that followed from COVID-19 is one whereby you have uh, a poorer or like more vulnerable uh, classes, communities uh, 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 across uh, regions that suffered the most. So, so again, I think this uh, speaks very loudly about uh, who uh, bears the brunt of conflicts, uh, and in this case, pandemics uh, under capitalism. Thank you very much. I'll give uh, uh, um, our panels a few minutes each to uh, answer uh, the questions. And as I do so, I'll just collect your answer from the Q&A. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, we can uh, use the same order of presentation uh, for this round. Gilbert. Okay, are you hearing me? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you, Alessandra. Um, yeah, I mean, very quickly, because uh, if you want to leave time for, for, for the audience, um, yeah, you, you put things uh, uh, quite, uh, quite well and quite uh, clearly. And uh, I mean, indeed, there have been a, a number of shifts uh, going on over the, the recent times of over the decades, that's what I tried to, to, uh, to outline. Um, you, you spoke of this, uh, uh, the two dimensions of conflict, you called uh, one spatial and the other uh, social relations. And uh, in, indeed, uh, uh, they, they were also connected. As you said, the elites in the global south were maybe could be regarded as part and parcel, or at least uh, depending on the kinds of elites, but the capitalist elites of, uh, of the global south were part and parcel of, uh, of uh, the, the, the global system of dom domination. Uh, the, uh, that, that is uh, very, very old. So this presence of the global north in the global south is, is old. The new phenomenon is the presence of the global south in the global north uh, in the form of migration. Here on the other end, not as part of the elite, but as part of the of the laborers of the of the, the working class. And so this this contributes to this uh, integration uh, of uh, of the world. And then we have also a shift with the generalization of of capitalism. Capitalism, I think, breeds struggle in some way. And uh, ultimately, the development of capitalism and the civilizational development, education, 
conscience, of uh, various forms of conscience, uh, uh, create both the objective and the ideological or political grounds for also a shift uh, um, or, or a, a rise in uh, or a combination of the struggles between what uh, we call in the jargon vertical inequalities and horizontal inequalities, gender, race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All, all these uh, kind of struggles that uh, have been developing tremendously uh, over uh, over uh, recent times, and uh, I would say it, it's uh, no coincidence that you had a term emerging uh, recently. You know, uh, to designate this uh, imbrication of uh, of struggles and conflicts, the term intersectionality, uh, which uh, which uh, is very much uh, is very much about that. Um, quickly on on the second point, uh, uh, the the yeah, what I, I was mentioning about uh, the pandemic with regard to uh, North South. Of course, the pandemic is a pandemic, so by definition. Uh, the very term means it's, it's, uh, it affects the, the, the whole uh, planet. And in terms of, of numbers, we can see that the United States, for instance, uh, have more uh, infected people than, uh, than countries like Brazil or India. So, so that's, uh, that would tend to, to give the impression that everybody is uh, all are equal. Uh, 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 in the face of, uh, of, of, of the, the disease. Uh, but it, it's not true because the, the, the means when you uh, just, if you look, I mean, even if you put aside, as I said, the health issues and the huge difference in health uh, 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 cap capacities in the means in between uh, rich countries and, uh, and poorer countries, uh, but if you take the, the economic impact, I mean, this is uh, tremendously uh, different because no uh, country in the global south would have the, the means to, 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 to launch the kind of stimulus plans that you have in the north, just to give you a figure, because I just finished recently an article. You'll, you'll see it soon, uh, Alessandra, on, on this issue. But I mean, just think of it that uh, uh, the, the stimulus plan in India was $10 billion. Uh, stimulus plan, the previous one, now they're discussing a new one, in the United States with uh, one quarter of the population of India was uh, $2 trillion, uh, that is 2,000 billion. So 10 billion, 2,000 billion, that gives you an idea. Thank you, Gilbert. Uh, that was a convincing uh, question, although um, I guess uh, uh, I still wonder, for instance, uh, uh, when I see countries like uh, um, India, the US or Brazil, uh, the UK scoring so poorly against the pandemic in relation to their responses and instead countries with very limited capacity like Ghana or Senegal or Vietnam instead doing excellent uh, work in terms of prevention. Uh, if there is, you know, very strong policy story there in terms of so which type of governments actually um, um, sort of uh, fail uh, their citizens. Um, I'll ask Gita to um, uh, uh, please engage with the, some of uh, the questions I posed as <laughs> I follow what's going on in the q and I think there is uh, someone that is struggling to pose the question. Uh, Alessandra, you've shut, up my, shut off my video. I can't start it or somebody has. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, I don't have such power, I'm afraid. I think it's Stephanie. I think it was Stephanie. So um, I think that let's start with, um, I mean, it's the, the questions uh, that you asked. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by welfare now, who is in and who is out. But um, I think that the thing, I mean, the, the reason I was surprised, the reason I began to think of welfare um, from below uh, was because I realized I was I was looking at um, the history of the British poor laws uh, in relation to what was going on in um, colonial South Asia. And I realized it was a completely different understanding of the idea of charity and largesse, right? So 
um, the poor laws are, were, were certainly um, before the, the new poor laws were instituted. Um, the old poor laws of the late uh, that were still being that were still in place in the late 18th century um, actually uh, came through. You know, people got uh, compensation and care through parishes. But the sense was, and this is the, the point of the, the, the charity in largesse, that people were being taken care of by something bigger than them, right? So, and the, the Paine, the Thomas Paine, uh, Condorcet discussions that Thomas Malthus kind of argued against uh, had the same kind of structure. In other words, you know, so, and then the Condorcet discussions and, and uh, pain discussions were, as I said, at least 10 years after the, um, the civil fund was already established. Now, so the thing that's interesting to me was that the idea of protection, when it was proposed, I mean, there was certainly, I'm making a big generic argument, but there were lots of forms of protection that were uh, set in place um, by the East India Company that were not proposed from below, right? But um, the first, the, the design of the first private public pension fund, the Madras Civil Fund, was absolutely proposed from the salaries of the people um, who were being, uh, you know, who was uh, factors in the East India Company. And I think it's important to, real, to, to actually understand that as something that's both literal and conceptual, because um, the reason I think it's important to understand that as conceptual is because the conceptual um, kind of mythos of welfare is it's given by the state to its citizens. It also constitutes the citizens as actually um, sort of not, not quite belonging. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, the other thing that's interesting about welfare is that um, you know, there isn't a sense that it's uh, a gen, whether it's a collective pool or an, or a pool composed of individual funds and different ways in which uh, welfare, and, I mean, um, pensions, let's talk about pensions and insurance come together. Um, the fact of the matter is the funding of it comes from groups of people who belong to the area, right? And that's something that's actually, that keeps on, uh, seem that keeps on being forgotten. Um, I think the other thing I have a couple. I mean, it's this is it's the topic is so large that it's hard to do it justice in in a, a, a few quick moments. But the last thing I want to say is um, what's interesting is when people get tossed out of protections from the state, the standard story is one that the state can no longer afford to do it, right? That's one um, standard, or the corporation um, can no longer afford to do it. Now, if you look at the East India Company, basically um, the, the civil funds invested in the company. The company agreed to pay their employees, took a portion of the salary from the employees and agreed to pay them after uh, retirement in different stru organizational structures that, that certainly for the Madras Civil Fund, the employees designed. Um, when the East India Company began to lose even more money than it had, and again, it's very schematic, it's the historical data is much more complicated. Um, it actually sent in actuaries to prove that the civil fund was bankrupt. The fund was not bankrupt. The organization that was bankrupt was the East India Company, and the money, the amount that they agreed to pay, they borrowed the money from their from their uh, employees, and the amount of interest they agreed to pay, they could no longer afford to pay it. And I think it's to me, it's a slight of this. This is an important kind of architectural, if you will, and political. Um, and poli uh, uh, economic political sleight of hand that I think we have to look at when we look at welfare. Um, you know, what is the slight? So rather than assuming that the figures are, are, are true, so this is the problem with the work on double entry bookkeeping is that one assumes <clears throat> states actually and corporations actually perform uh, a transparent form 
of double entry bookkeeping. But in fact, um, when you actually look at double entry bookkeeping from the global perspective of the global south and the perspective of um, colonial states, you actually realize that it consists of a series of sleights of hand. And I think um, I'd like us to actually take those um, as necessary to how we understand the abrogation of states and corporations um, to their promises, because the promises can only be abrogated one way, right? I can't say to a bank, I'm sorry, I need to uh, stop paying my loan, I have no money. So I want to say, um, I think, uh, Alessandra, you made a really good point about COVID. And the thing is, um, I think what's interesting uh, about the impact of COVID-19 is it's not just how much, uh, how well countries are managing their finances. And I'd, I'd actually take uh, Gilbert up on his, um, I mean, this is a much more complicated uh, idea of how India is working. I mean, stimulus packages are not the only way one actually thinks about reviving an economy. Um, so I, I would, I, I, the one thing I would say, uh, 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 Alessandra, is the point that you make, which is extremely important, is it's not how much, how well funded an economy is in some simple way, but in fact, the type of government um, that, uh, you know, that, that and, and the way in which the, uh, a particular kind of governance um, or form of governmentality um, has been institutionalized in a state. Um, and again, I'm being very generic here, that actually uh, gives us some indication of how effective um, the, the COVID-19 measures in, a, in an area are going to be. So. Thanks a lot, Gita. Terry. Hi, uh, I, I really don't want to take too much time because there are a, couple, uh, a few questions from uh, the audience, which uh, would be good to look at. Um, I, I think the entry of new players into um, so-called aid is indicative of how it, it relates directly to um, exercising power. So new, new actors like Japan and uh, um, China, um, they combine what you might call soft power in, uh, to try to gain influence with um, investments. They, they're taking um, civil engineering contracts, which they can get either through the China Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank, building bridges in Bangladesh, for example, enormous expenditures, which are um, um, financed through, through mainly through loans, not grants. So um, it, it's part of business. It's, it, you can just, just like the Netherlands goes around Asia at the moment saying, we can help you solve your flood problems. Um, and then the country will take out a loan with the Asian Development Bank and give the contract to a, a Dutch civil engineering company. They can all play that game now. So uh, the link between so-called aid loans and so on, this is really important because a lot of aid is actually done through loans, not through grants. Um, really, really important to un understand that difference. So it's basically still giving business to um, the corporations, which used to be Western, but now include Chinese, Indian and um, Japanese corporations. As regards the private actors, principally what are called billionaire philanthropists, um, my take on that, as I, as I said in my talk, is that these people have got their billions through nefarious means. There's, there's no way in which most normal moral people on this earth would find it acceptable that some, somebody accumulates that amount of wealth. And if they are managing to do it, there is something wrong with the systems that enable that to happen, uh, which is, again, a reflection of how power operates. So the fact that some of them want to um, use this, uh, as they would say, to do good is, is quite interesting and it deserves looking at. There are a couple of uh, billionaire th philanthropists I'm aware of. One is, um, I think she's uh, in the Disney family. I think she's the niece of uh, Walt Disney who is trying to give away all her money and she has quite a good critique of capitalism. And there's another rather private billionaire philanthropist who a couple of months ago um, announced that he has managed to give away all his money. Um, there are a few others who have pledged to give away huge amounts, 
but but the problem is that they're getting it in the first place um, uh, amounts of money which are uh, you know how many yachts can they buy how many houses can they buy so it's we really need to look at that system and we need to understand why is it that research institutions my own included are trying to increase the amount of money they're getting from these people uh, it seems to me that we can't on the one hand have a critique of unfairness exploitation and oppression in the world and that is the critique of development research of the capitalist system and then on the other hand willingly accept money from the proceeds of that capitalist system. Um, so I think that that's um, a, a short answer to something which is quite a complex issue. I hope that helps. You're on mute. Um, yes, I'm I am. Sorry. Yes, I am. Thanks. I said it, it really does help. Yes, thank you very much for your thorough answer. I have uh, Steve. Um, and then we have three questions, which I hope uh, we're going to address from the Q&A section. Um, thank you. Um, Alexandra, I think you raised a very question about the Taiwanese capitalists. There are indeed some very rich and powerful capitalists in Taiwan. But in terms of the Chinese narrative, they all willingly or not accept or acknowledge and or at least not challenge the Chinese narrative. And that is for a very simple reason. In the last 30 years, all the major Taiwanese capitalists have enlarged their fortunes on the basis of their operations on the mainland of China. And the Chinese government has made it absolutely crystal clear that if any one of them should be singing from a hymn sheet different from that issued by the Communist Party of China, pun intended there, then they will have their fortune taken away from them, or at least their means of making or keeping their fortunes removed from them. So the capitalists in Taiwan are subjected to um, the need to accept or acknowledge or tolerate or play by the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party, just like everybody else. None of them would dare to mention a simple historical fact, which is that the Communist Party of China had from the 1920s all through until towards the end of the 1940s, been one of the strongest advocates of independence of Taiwan. It is not something new. This is something that the Communist Party had advocated for two decades. None of them could even say that. None of them could even cite the historical sources to justify that. They could not even cite the Communist Party documents which uh, advocate those, the independence of Taiwan. This shows you how much the power of a rising power can be one that is becoming very, very rich. And here, if I may, I'll just sort of echo very quickly to the uh, point you raised about the COVID-19. I think the one thing interesting for me in this particular context about the COVID-19 and China is how effectively China has shaped or affected the way how we have the uh, narrative about COVID-19. We are not even outside of China, able to establish and find out how COVID-19 really originated. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that the Chinese government was responsible for it and therefore they were covering up. We don't know. But we are not allowed to find out because the Chinese government doesn't want to take the risk that any independent investigations into the origins of COVID-19 might embarrass the Chinese government. The control of that narrative, I think is very, very important. Uh, I mean, th there are a couple of questions related to that, that, at least one question related to that, but I won't do that until, uh, unless you ask me to do so. So I'll hand it back to you now, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Steve. That's such an insightful answer, actually intriguing, if uh, uh, disquieting some of the things you raised. Um, 
I have a uh, uh, few questions. Uh, one is, uh, well, two actually, by Kevin Deb, uh, Webb, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to interweave them together. Someone who has lived in Shenzhen, China, and visited museums there in other parts of China, the rewriting of history of both Tibet, Taiwan, is the narrative, the, ch uh, uh, the Chinese belief, and, uh, and, and it's illustrated and enforced in these uh, uh, museums. Uh, that is uh, uh, a segment of the question. And, um, and also that nobody has mentioned corruption, but uh, 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 that is uh, uh, very high um, in, uh, well, in Thailand now, that skew the wealth towards the rich, those in government, those working for the government, uh, teachers, civil servants, etc. So I guess, okay, so there's the same speaker, but there's fairly different questions. So one relates uh, to uh, the actual ways in which uh, 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 the narrative uh, uh, that you talked about, uh, Steve, is internalized by the Chinese people themselves, I guess, and uh, uh, also through the production of uh, uh, popular knowledge inside China. And the second issue is uh, uh, one on uh, uh, um, corruption um, and, and sort of, uh, um, uh, a, you know, the, the support towards the wealthier uh, um, classes. Although I'm quite not sure that this is only for uh, for Steve because the example uh, that is uh, provided by Kivan is, is, is Thailand. So perhaps others might want to uh, comment on that. Um, another question, uh, I'll just read also the other because uh, um, it's, uh, um, uh, by a different author, Halil, that asks, uh, in the tension between the US and China, how do you assess the Chinese arguments and defense of the right uh, to uh, development? And I think uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps also a very good question uh, for uh, Terry. So uh, Steve, if you want to go first and then I'll just get uh, the answer by uh, Terry. Sure. Um, very good questions. Um, the issue about the Chinese narrative of um, Tibet and other bits, I think we have, if I may, I would like to answer it in two, in two ways. All, all governments in some ways try to shape uh, the, the historical narratives and not all of them are always entirely truthful. But at least when you are dealing with that in democratic countries, other people can challenge them. When you're dealing with it in China, you are not allowed to challenge that. I think that is really the big difference there. Um, what we have to bear in mind in the, in the situation in China is that the Communist Party has a monopoly of the truth and it has a monopoly of history because the party is very much aware that he or she who controls the presence controls the past and by controlling the past one controls the future and that's where they are going and that's what they want to do um, when we are dealing with a domestic context of uh, deliberately using a kind of particular nationalisms to shape the thinking of one's own people, uh, one can understand it. I'm not saying that it's a good thing. I think we, we should be encouraged people to think freely uh, and challenge that too, but at least we can understand that. But when that is being extended beyond one's border, then we are dealing with a much more serious issue. And that is where we are dealing with in the case of China there. Um, I think, I think um, uh, Alexandra has asked um, someone else to address the other issue. So I will leave it there. Thanks, Steve. Terry? Um, I wasn't quite sure which question it was you would like me to look at. Um, 
Uh, there is a question about uh, uh, the right to development, which I thought you would be in a particular good uh, position to answer. So in relation to the tension between US and China, um, how do you assess, uh, how would you assess the Chinese arguments uh, and defense? Uh, yeah, to the okay, right to develop? I'm yeah. just saying, uh, I'll ask you because I think uh, it's the Chinese, uh, um, uh, well, it, it's uh, it interrogates China, but to an extent, I think has been an argument that has been put forward by a number of uh, uh, developing uh, uh, countries. Uh, and mm -hmm. if uh, just one second, if uh, uh, Gita instead could take the question uh, um, posed by uh, uh, Kevin uh, uh, as well, after you finish your answer, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not sure what the questioner was. Uh, meaning in this question about the conflict between US and China, but it's very evident in, in arguments about climate change and who should contribute more to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and, and basically this argument led to the failure of the Copenhagen COP meeting um, 10 years ago, uh, because China argued for the right to um, develop, which meant emitting lots of carbon dioxide from coal-fired power stations and from its industries and so on. Um, I, I think it's very evident to people that this is not about a right to develop. It's, a, it's about a, a right to make profits and to command the, the economy. Um, because um, actually since then, China has become the, the world's leading um, economy using renewable energy, wind and solar power in particular. So their ability to transition away from using coal uh, or begin that transition um, was a very, very positive thing, but that was under their own particular forms of capitalism. Um, and uh, although coal has um, not diminished nearly, nearly enough. So th this notion of a right to development is, uh, has to be couched around the idea of what that development consists of. If it consists of increased inequality and environmental damage, uh, then many, many people involved in development these days would not call that good development. So um, this was a, a, an issue around sovereignty and political argument, not about whether or not it's good development. Thanks a lot, Terry. Gita. Um, very quickly, I think I'm uh, responding to Kevin's question. I mean, Kevin's... Um, uh, sort of uh, comments on uh, Thailand um, and socialized medicine to actually go back to what um, Alessandra said, which is, um, and what I sort of ended with, which is, um, I think socialized medicine, I was talking to a doctor in India, and basically one of the things he uh, pointed out was the states in India that did the best with um, COVID-19, uh, even within one country with those in which um, healthcare was available to all, to almost everybody on a more equitable basis. Um, and I think socialized, certain forms of socialized medicine certainly permit that and allow for, for a different kind of response. And um, that those forms of socialized medicine don't in fact have to just come um, in, be available to people, to denizens, I'd say denizens rather than just citizens, people who live in the, the area. Uh, because the country um, is considered one that is quote unquote highly developed or one that's uh, considered, um, you know, uh, economically completely and utterly viable. Uh, Cuba is a case in point. So with that, I end. Thanks a lot. I do have a last question after which I'll take the panel to a close, um, which is by Zulfikar Banji. Uh, who's asking um, if uh, the, do we think that people should implement change in their own communities uh, in terms of creating systems of knowledge, a fair distribution of wealth, education and investment uh, and participating in competitive uh, uh, um, business uh, um, just uh, co co related to a Robin Hood figure. I'm not sure. Um, 
um, how that relates to that, because we just, I think here the issue is uh, to what extent there's space for other forms uh, of engagement uh, in the context of uh, the uh, uh, conflictual uh, nature of uh, uh, capitalism. Um, whoever wants to answer the question can uh, actually uh, come forward. Yeah, okay, Terry. Something if you like. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, Zulka. I, I think basically what you're saying is the need for class struggle. Now that, that sounds very vague and so on, but basically what we have to do is to look back to how these transformations to better life happened in other countries over, over time. Um, and, and if we look at that, then it, it emerges because of people's organizations, trade unions, um, women organizing around suffrage and other rights. And, and so we need to look at how, how did Britain go from uh, being cutthroat capitalism in the 19th century involving uh, slavery on a huge scale towards the welfare state, which began to emerge at the end of the 19th century and came to its peak um, in the 1950s and 60s, how did that happen? It happened because um, there was enough pressure of people from the, from the grassroots through these class and gender organizations to uh, get elected a party which was in favor of those. The, the Labour Party was in favor of having those welfare conditions, the socialized medicine that one of the other questioners asked. So I, I don't really actually understand why people in development studies talk about transformations, uh, this new newish buzzword, without actually going back to look in history at how it happened in other countries. How did it happen in China to go from landlordism to much more equitable distribution of land uh, and wealth? I know it didn't always, you know, hasn't always ended up right, but that transition was amazing. Um, Gita has already referred to Cuba as an example of a country where this grassroots movement um, led to a, a kind of a state which has embedded within it the idea of fairness. Um, and, and I think that's what we can learn from. So Zuldika, what we have to do is create all of these organizations that push for that from the bottom. Yep, and I will, I'll, I'll echo Terry. In fact, um, the, we're, we're being trained to think that, you know, we have to sort of reconstitute ourselves in a different way. But in fact, it's collective organizing um, that actually got the uh, Madras Civil Fund um, started. I mean, the first private public pension fund, which I say, unlike Terry, is the genesis of the under a certain understanding of welfare, took a long time and it took a group of people and it took a group of people fighting. So um, I absolutely, at second Terry, to say that's where um, transformations occur from the grassroots and from collective struggle, not from individual work. Thank you, Gita. And I want to uh, thank you all panelists for having been with us and share uh, their ideas on uh, capital and conflict. I want to thank uh, very much uh, uh, the SOAS Festival of Ideas support that has been like uh, hidden, but very helpful in the background. And uh, I want to thank all the public for, their, for staying with us during this uh, one hour and 45 minutes. I learned a lot and I hope you have as well. And uh, with this, I leave you to the other many interesting sessions we have uh, uh, at this OAS uh, um, Festival of Ideas. Thanks again for, to um, all our panelists. Uh, and uh, Thank you. Uh, that is all from Thank you. Us. Thank you. You're great. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.